I will submit to you that uh, we are in a very disruptive change because never before in uh, human history have consumers, people throughout the world, the seven billion people, not all of them, but throughout the world, they have more choice. Okay, now the choice has been coming ever since like the 60s and the 70s where, uh, like I think in the 70s, uh, how many pairs of blue jeans, uh, different types of blue jeans were there? I think there were like, I think it was six or seven. And now there's more than 700 different brands of blue jeans. And of course, with the internet invented in 1993, consumers have more choices than ever. This puts more pressure on companies, so there's choice. Okay, so choice is not that new, but what is new is voice. So I call this trend choice in voice, because now people not only can they choose, I'll buy this or I'll buy this or I'll, uh, or I'll buy this, they have all kinds of choices, but now they can also talk about those choices. They can say, your product stinks. And we all know the examples. Remember the Netflix dude when he, uh, he, he changed the pricing plan <laughs> and then everyone, there was an uproar on the internet? And, and there's you know, hundreds of examples of that now. So you're, if you're running a company, okay, not only do you have to be competitive by, by giving people better choices, but you have to be concerned about what they're gonna say about you. And they can say positive things and they can say negative things. Forrester estimates, I think I have a slide on this later, that by 2016, one billion people of the seven billion will have smartphones and tablets, okay? And, and, that's, and that's rising as well. All of those people are connected and that's a potential uh, to, to provide them personalized uh, digital experiences. So firms that now make things personal, those are the firms that are gonna thrive in the future and the other ones are gonna kind of drop off. I was at a huge hotel chain two weeks ago. They have 3,700 hotels. And they told me, Mike, we're, all of our systems are changing. We need, to, we need to make more personalized offers. We need to make things more personal for the customers. Have you heard the Safeway story? Uh, the Safeway story uh, where someone, wa they, they're, they're experimenting uh, with personalization where someone walks in Safeway and they, they, uh, an employee recognizes that they're there and they bring them a cup of coffee because they know they've ordered that in the past. And then they give them a coupon uh, to buy flowers at the florist because they know he's never bought flowers there before. So they're experimenting with all kinds of personalization. Um, also, uh, the IRS. Do you know the IRS? Um, <laughs> you do, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, the IRS, uh, has been doing this for a while where people call in, they use voice detection, they detect if you're angry. Everyone's angry when they call the IRS, <laughs> aren't they? But, um, and they, they channel that call to a different bank of, of, uh, of uh, I don't know if you call them agents or customer service reps. Um, and of course, Homeland Security is, is looking at video on people's faces to determine, say, their mood uh, their likelihood of, a, of certain behaviors. But couldn't that same video camera, when I walk into a Starbucks, detect that I have low blood sugar and like give me one of those little scones, those little vanilla scone things? Um, that's data, okay? And that's really big data because that's video data. I mean, you all know if you have a video camera, when you upload that, that takes up a lot of space, right? So there's just enormous ways of using data uh, here to make it personal. So. Um, but back to big data, what is driving this whole big data trend is, again, it's the population, and it's the population using more technology. So the more technology they use, the more data they generate. We estimate that by uh, 2016, there'll be a billion people using smartphones and, and tablets. Uh, and it's just remarkable to think that there's seven billion people on the planet, and you know that this number is just gonna keep increasing. Now, it's not just people, though, okay? There's also more devices. Uh, a Cisco study uh, predicts that there'll be 25 billion de devices connected to the internet by 2015. So these are all those little scales I told you about, or even automotive technology. When you pull into your garage, it senses your Wi-Fi network and uploads some stuff. So there's essentially more devices, more connection is what's generating all of this data. But what exactly is big data <laughs> besides the big buzzword. Well, you may have heard the three V's. Have you, heard of, have you heard the three V's, volume, velocity, and variety? So this is kind of the conventional 
uh, definition of big data is that it consists of volume. So that's the amount of data in bytes. Um, so for $163, you can go to Amazon and buy a three terabyte hard drive. Um, uh, but there's also petabytes and gigabytes and Yahoo and Google deal with huge amounts of data. That's the volume. So that's the way to measure the size of the data. The other definition of big data is the velocity, how quickly that data um, comes through. So think of uh, algorithmic trading, think of Wall Street, and think of all those price changing data and how quickly that comes and, and, the, and the latency, the low latency that's needed to make those trades. That's velocity. Um, or think of everyone on their uh, mobile phone transmitting their GPS location uh, to uh, Foursquare, for example, or Google Maps. Uh, that's a high velocity of data. And then there's also variety. There's structured data, you know, think of like name and address, uh, structured data, but then there's also unstructured data, the text that you enter into L.L. Bean when you review a sweater um, on L.L. Bean. And do you realize that L.L. Bean looks at those ratings and anything that's a th a three stars, they go to their product manager and they say, we have to remove this product because they only want four and five star products on their, on their website. That's just a little tangent. Um, so there's lots of uh, variety of data as well. So when you think of how to measure big data, this is the measures. The problem with it <laughs> is that these measures keep expanding. So, that, so I'm not going to say big data means a petabyte or three petabytes. It just means whatever, however you measure big data, what's your ability to handle it? So the question is, do you have a big data problem? If you can't handle the amount of data that you need to handle, you have a big data problem. But this is not enough of a definition, because this is simply measuring big data. Um, what is also important is the activities. Okay, so the activities is storing the data. Can you store it? So if you're, so if you're a company, can you store all the data you need to? And clearly, from that other data slide, uh, companies are struggling just with the storage of the data. The next thing you have to do is be able to process it or analyze it. Okay, so it's not just enough to store it. Big data is not a storage problem. That's not what's exciting about big data. It's not like, oh, we've got so much data, how can we store it? Okay, there's plenty of companies willing to sell storage. There's some open source that I'll talk about later, like Hadoop. How many people have heard of Hadoop? Okay, so Hadoop is one storage solution. Uh, but the other thing is how to access that data, how to use that data. This is why big data is so exciting. Uh, to most companies is because they can mine this data, and we'll talk about what that means, they, and, or how, how you do it. They can mine this data uh, to find out more about their customers to determine how to provide these better personalized experiences. So many firms, though, ask the question, okay, I'm in. What do I do? Uh, do I have the technologies to handle this big data? Why is big data exciting? Partially because with more data, you have the more likelihood of causative variables in your formula. So let's keep going. So everyone knows the Netflix. Uh, you can dazzle customers. Netflix, isn't that a dazzling experience when they, it's kind of boring now, right? Because we all have dopamine in our brains, and dopamine gets bored very quickly. Um, so now we just expect it. <laughs> we expect a great recommendation engine. But I also say Google Search Engine is a great example of a customer experience that uses predictive analytics. This is the most valuable company who's built on predictive analytics because what they do is they do predictive analytics and they say, if you enter a phrase into this box, I am going to return to you a customized experience and you're going to say, wow, this is great. And so that actually is a customer experience, and they're constantly creating this predictive model. The whole business is built on a predictive model. Um, I mentioned hospitals. Hospitals uh, are using uh, big data to determine how to prevent a readmittance. Um, you might be interested in a site called Kaggle.com, K-A-G-G-L-E.com. They run data contests. They provide data, and then they run contests. There's a contest now on this uh, hospital readmittance and whoever comes up with a predictive model against the data set there, I think wins a few million dollars. Um, now, I mentioned manufacturing cases uh, to prevent breakdowns. Um, have you ever been to a factory? That's like, I love going to factories because you've got all that moving parts and stuff. 
And there's a lot of vibrating parts in there too. And it turns out that a vibrating, the more vibrations can predict that that part might be ready to be replaced. And of course, you don't want to replace the part too soon because that costs you more money. And you don't want to replace it when it breaks down because we'll shut the line down. So predict, pred predictive analytics have been used to prevent breakdowns, prevent maintenance as well, um, and then also sell more. Have you heard of the uh, 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 <coughs> diapers and beer on Thursday? Um, so obviously supermarkets do tons of predictive models about what assortments to have in the stores. Um, all of that is predictive models. And uh, they did one where they, they found out, uh, they did a market basket analysis, which, which looks at what products are bought together. And they found out that beer and diapers, they should put beer and diapers together uh, on a Thursday for some reason. I, I'm not, I, don't, I can't remember why. Um, and then also you can find opportunities using the predictive analytics too. Uh, it's used in oil exploration all the time. So this is just a, a few examples of how they're used today. And as I said before, big data reinvigorates this because great predictive models depend on great data. The bottom line is that predictive analytics uh, combined with big data gives you more ability to create predictive models and that gives you more ability to personalize uh, your customer experience and the solution that you give to these customers. So I've focused on the customer experience, but big data is leading to an explosion in knowledge that's, that will also allow firms to make smarter decisions. I showed you some of those use cases about the maintenance. So there's a whole operational side of this as well. Uh, but the customer experience side of it is where sort of the action is right now. Um, so under using this big data, and this is why it's not just a buzzword, is because people are finding the knowledge in that big data. So it's not just about storing it. It's not just about its massive size. It's about mining that data to, to, to create knowledge that you can use uh, to out-compete. So um, as we find, we find ourselves here today, or I find myself here today, because you're already here, um, <laughs> uh, the bottom line for this, I think, is that there are seven, seven billion uh, potential consumers. Um, in one form or the other. And they're expecting, because of choice and voice, they're expecting uh, firms to build those predictive models and to personalize that experience. And the, the reason why firms are spending enorm investing enormously uh, in big data technologies and in predictive analytics is because of that, is to create those, those better uh, customer experiences. When you're out talking to clients, what, what's your sense of the biggest challenges and opportunities that, that they're facing in, for, in, in implementing big data strategies? Is it in data collection? Is it in organizational alignment around the strategy? Is it in finding the right predictive tools? Where, where do you see the biggest Yeah, points? so, so in IT, when, you, when you ask IT people that, it's just storing the data. It, you know, a lot of it, is, it's two things. It's storing it, because there, there are so many questions about Hadoop. Uh, to store their unstructured data? Uh, does Hadoop replace data warehouse? So just the, the fact that they need to store it. Um, and a lot of that talk is about unstructured data. Um, the second IT problem is integrating it, uh, meaning getting it all in one place. Because you've got the business side. You've got the business side who has data scientists or, or a customer intelligence department or something saying, I need more data. And it's some over here, it's over here. So it's all over the place. And so getting that data uh, together is, is kind of a challenge for IT. The business, there's two things. Either they get it, and their frustration is with IT in terms of getting this data. And they're also like, data governance has to change. Gov you know, uh, IT wants to govern the data and control it. And they're used to like creating these, these, uh, uh, these well thought out models. And data science doesn't work that way. Data science says, give me everything you got and I'm going to run one of these algorithms against it. Okay, and that's kind of against that, 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 uh, that, that data governance thing. Um, and then the other problem with business that I see is that they don't really understand this at all. They don't get it. Now, the one billion plus companies, they're doing it at a departmental level somewhere. Like, um, uh, you know, insurance companies are pretty good at this stuff because they <laughs> have a lot of math uh, uh, and statistics. But I talked to one department. What they do is they send inspectors out to houses. All right, so say you have a house and you sign up for homeowner's policy. Uh, they want a predictive model where they can determine, should I send an inspector to your house? 
okay, because it costs them $37 to send someone to the house. Uh, so what is the, you know, so they use, so they use a, they use a data, they use data mining, they use a predictive model to determine that. Um, and that's not like some big research investigation, it's simply using the data to see if there's a predictive model that, that you know, that, that's, that's predictive. So there's an understanding. But what's happening is that companies, it's like anything that was like in one particular department, now they're trying to figure out how can I use this more broadly across the organization. 